first connected over is the fact that we both have almost no memories from childhood. And I, like you, used to think there was something terribly wrong with me that I was going to have early on stage Alzheimer's, that there was something off. It's menopause. It's this, it's that, it's my anxiety. And I, I, I have so many experiences, like talking to my best friend from childhood, Jody Brick, and she'll be like, remember that time? And it's not little shit, Dr. Nicole. It's like, remember that time you came to visit me at Central Michigan University? I'm like, no. She's like, yeah, you came for the weekend. I'm like, I don't remember that. And so learning that it's not only just me and it's not something wrong with my brain that this is a function of the childhood shit that is in my nervous system and how I was coping and processing all this stuff that impacted my ability to make memories and that that's okay. And I actually think it's way more common than you think. Absolutely. And, and I'll speak to the point of how recent it is for me, even in the early years of my relationship with my partner, Lolly. I mean, she has talk about the opposite. She has an elephant memory. This girl can remember like what I was wearing and like wild. And she, there's many things and moments where she's like, do you remember when we, you know, went to this place, did this thing. And up until, you know, very recently, my answer has been no. I don't remember, you know, being there with you, going, meeting this person really. Um, can you, and I always be like, can you say more about like what happened? And maybe um, I can recollect given other details, you know, given what she said. But sometimes when I was in, you know, a place that we might have revisited, I'll get a feeling of familiarity. She'll be like, oh, yeah, you don't remember when we were here last time? We did this. This person was here. I might not have that recall, but my body feels somewhat familiar to what she's describing, what she's saying, the environment that we're in. And again, I just want to share that, you know, it didn't miraculously for me go away the second I realized I, I didn't remember because when I first met Lolly, I was very disconnected. I was very dissociated. I was there in person, right? Having interactions in all of these different places, but my attention, my awareness, myself was so, so far away that again, I, I still didn't retain those, those recall based memories and moments. So I just want to share that again, because I think some of us might still have many moments. We might have something last week that we're hearing from a loved one that we did or didn't do, or, you know, a place that we were at, and we might not have the ability to recall that. And again, that might be maybe for someone listening, an indicator of how, you know, lacking presence of how there might've been something that feels unsafe. You might generally never feel safe. Your nervous system might still be so dysregulated that you're still on that spaceship. So your answer is honest to God, no. You don't yet remember that thing, though I will share that as I become conscious. And for me, it's a daily commitment. It's a daily intention um, because I do have that habit to check out, to dissoci dissociate, especially as stress goes up. It doesn't immediately just, my nervous system doesn't just get on board. I have to teach myself how to stay grounded, how to stay connected, how to tolerate more and more stress so that I don't just check out and I can begin to remember and retain the life that I'm living. So you use the word dysregulated nervous system. Can you give us all just the basic kind of what do we need to know about healing and about breaking generational cycles when it comes to our nervous system? Because we've already unpacked that most of us have an adult physical body, yet we are locked in a child we're locked at a, at a child, like a child's age in terms of our ability to process emotion. And that is a hundred percent based on what you experienced as a kid in your household and your response to those experiences, whether it was to tantrum or you talked about kind of shutting down or fawning or it was to, you know, what was the other one? I've, we've got, we, there are three, right? That you do, that you can do, you like fight or To fly. explode outward, yes. to, to fight, to check out, to flee or distance, distract ourselves from the situation, to fawn, to always be hypervigilant, tending to the circumstance around us. And there's a fourth to shut down entirely like me on my spaceship far, far away. Gotcha. So as a kid, you learn to do one of those things based on your parents' inability to cope with their emotion. It's how you protected yourself. But now here you are, you're 30, 40, 50, 70, 20, whatever. And you're like, this shit's not working. And 
I, I got to get a, a hold of this. And you talk so much about the nervous system. Can you tell everybody now that we're awake and conscious that I want to go back and I want to figure out how to heal? What role does the nervous system play in this? And what does a dysregulated nervous system mean? Yeah. So just, you know, going back to all of those different ways that we were just exploring um, and overviewing, we tend to our emotions as an indicator of dysregulation because our body's ability, emotions live in our body, their physiological shifts, changes, changes in energy, changes in hormones governed by our nervous system. So our ability to, to deal with, to rel- right, be with, like you were talking about earlier, and tend to and regulate our emotions is completely impacted by our nervous system. And so is everything else in terms of how we're going about the world. And I think this is, you know, a little kind of the bigger picture of nervous system that it extends beyond even how much stress or how much ability do I have to tolerate, to regulate, to stay responsive within stress or my emotional upsetting emotional experiences, our emotion, our our nervous system dictates how we're navigating the world around us, how connected we do feel. It begins with, and um, I was very intentional in separating the new workbook, How to Meet Yourself, into three different sections. And assuming that most people that will know my work will be attracted to the workbook, um, the self that I'm referencing, and the title is Your Authentic Self, that deeper being um, that houses what makes you uniquely you, you, Mel, and me uniquely me. It houses our purpose, our passion, our interests, our curiosities, our ability to play, to be joyful. All of that stuff that many of us, I'm sure many of you listening, feel so disconnected from. So maybe I'm mean, but I very intentionally, I did not start the book with how to meet your authentic self. It's broken up into three different sections. Why? And the first, And the first section is how to meet your body, how to reconnect with your body. Because if you're in that survival mode, if your body is just trying to make it into the next moment or so it thinks, oftentimes, again, based in past experiences, based in past perceptions, if you're not able to navigate these emotional moments and you're bringing up stories from your past and filtering your present moment through them in terms of your whole mental or emotional habit-based world, then you're not going to be able to have that safe space to reconnect, to ask those deeper questions. You're going to be locked in survival mode. So your whole way of being in terms of how connected do you feel to the world you created around me. It's no surprise that as I entered my thirties, my answer was not at all. There was a time where I would read about people. I have a very um, vivid memory of reading one of my few. I was reading a book by Dr. Wayne Dyer and he was a psychologist trained, clinical trained psychologist like myself. And he was sharing more of a kind of his personal evolution from being a clinical psychologist and reconnecting with his passion and his purpose and really changing kind of the way he worked, becoming an author, beginning to speak. Um, And I read the book at the same time that my partner at the time, Lolly, read the book. And she was so, you know, oh my God, so inspired, you know, and would talk about her passion and things that interest her. She's such a curious individual just in generally. And I read the book and I was like, that's a nice story. I, I think that maybe that purpose gene, that passion thing, it skipped me. Here's another, right along with time, right along lines with that neurological, you know, memory issue. I was like, I don't feel passionate, even though again, I was marching right. I, for as long as I, for as long as you would have heard me talking about what I want to be when I grow up, I was going to be a psychologist though. It didn't come from what I was hearing passion, purpose, right? Interest, curiosity felt like. Um, And again, all of that is because if we don't feel safe in our body, if we can't witness our emotions, be with them, remain responsive, take the value in them and allow ourselves to return back to safety, if we're, in other words, in survival mode, we're not going to have the ability to relax into, to explore things that we're interested in and curious about. We're not going to be able to identify or even connect with what our passion and our purpose might be, let alone make choices that are in alignment, live into that passion and that purpose. So our nervous system going back kind of full circle really governs all of that. We're not going to be all feel authentically connected. What is one of the first things I say when we began this conversation? I was in relationships. I had a very active social life for as long as I can remember. I didn't feel connected though to the people around me. It was that kind of idea of being alone in a crowded room. I mean, if that didn't really describe my whole existence, because again, the reality of it was I wasn't authentically connected to myself. I wasn't authentically 
being me. I was always suppressing what my truth was in fear of upsetting someone else and hoping to people please or show up as they needed me. And I was operating in a version of survival mode. So the workbook, again, will take you through um, the journey of first reconnecting with that very unique individual body of yours that does share some universal components around our nervous system, beginning to explore and identify whether your nervous system is reacting to threats, whether or not they're present or not in your environment. Then we, you know, can evolve, peel back the onion, if you will, and begin to explore, right? The ego, this story, all of these creations, narratives that we began to repeat from childhood that are continuing to often color these moments of reactivity. It's not necessarily what happens that upsets us. It's the sense that we're making of it. It's the meaning that we've assigned to the actions or the non-actions in our life that create those explosive moments or those moments where you're like me, come close, but don't come too close because I'm going to dagger you or whatever it is. And until again, we learn how to create enough space to be responsive, to understand that our emotions are what make us alive and to learn how to then regulate and navigate them, we're not going to have a chance at reconnecting with our authentic self and at discovering those deeper, deeper aspects of our being. So our nervous system really runs our whole ship it's um, everything. from the moment we're born, from the moment, actually, if I want to go back further, the moment we begin our development. And for me, I, I believe that in a mother who was dis distracted, disconnected, who was dealing with very serious health-related issues in my older sister at the time, who had her own, own health anxiety of her father dropping dead when she was er in her early, early 20s of a heart attack, of seeing a very catastrophic car accident coming home from honeymoon with my dad when they were driving home from Florida. My mom was so nervous that actually a story that was gifted to me at her funeral um, just a year and a half ago, my aunt was sharing, she got up to speak and it was a very sweet story. And she was sharing the story of my mom, when my mom discovered she was pregnant with me and how it began was my mom started to have symptoms, morning sickness symptoms. She was 42 years old at the time. And it was 15 years after she had her last kid. I was definitely not a planned um, product. They, they were done. Um, so they thought of having children. So when my mom started to have stomach illness symptoms as consistently as, you know, morning sickness would attribute to, she began to entertain the idea secretively first before she shared it with this aunt of mine that she had stomach cancer, which is right in alignment, right? We have a health-based anxiety, a lot yep. of health-based fear because my sister, you know, has her own health issues. My mom has chronic health issues. Of course, that's the meaning she made out of these symptoms. And she shared it with this particular aunt who urged her to go to a doctor to go see, you know, if it is indeed stomach cancer. So she could begin treatment for that. And that's when she was gifted with the information that it wasn't stomach cancer at all. It was me developing inside of her. And the reason I'm sharing that is, and it, our first environment is that uterus, that, you know, that body of the, the human who, who had us, you know, who birthed us. So ultimately for me, what I now know, and it's not surprising that a, a very commonly shared story in my family is when I was born, and I was born, you know, healthy and, you know, thankfully everything was okay. I was actually born with a little um, sore on my thumb and I sucked my thumb up until I was, you know, much older. And there, the joke then was, is you were sucking your thumb in, in your mom's belly. You know, you were sucking your thumb in utero and I couldn't agree more. I probably was because the amount of cortisol and stress that that environment, you know, was for me with my mom unable. I mean, she thought she was possibly dying of stomach cancer. How fearful she must have been of no fault of her own. In my opinion, my earliest environment felt unsafe. So I was soothing myself as a little developing fetus, trying to regulate what was for me this overwhelming, stressful environment. So in my opinion, um, the environments that we're talking about that can contribute to our nervous system dysregulation begin when we begin our development. And that's where generational trauma comes in. Because, you know, I, I relate to what you were just talking about, Dr. Nicole, because I can, you know, when you look back with compassion and understanding, I go, my God, my mom was 18. Unexpected, surprise, here comes Mel, drops out of college gets married, like all these things she didn't expect far away from her family. I can only imagine how much cortisol and fear and anxiety and upset was coursing through her veins. I think about how alone she and dad were, not near family and just how hard it must have been. And so, and I also see how that fashioned a hypervigilant, 
very anxious, overachieving, uh, you know, person in me. And I want to just to land this for anybody listening where this is brand new. You've never even considered these concepts. When Dr. Nicole talks about the nervous system, I want you, and then she talks about slowing down and, you know, working through, for example, the first part of the book, which is going to force you to slow down. And it's going to force you to get out of the autopilot of your life and truly go inward and consider your lived experience in your body. The visual that I think about is your nervous system is sort of like the engine of a car. And it's like, for me, revving all the time. And so my lived experience for a long time, my version of autopilot was feeling like I was a car that was at, you know, like that was just the engine was revved all the time, but I wasn't going anywhere. And that I had this sense of always like trying, 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 but no relief of feeling like it was enough. And what happens and what Dr. Nicole is saying is available to you, that you are your best healer, that you can pull over. Like the view that you are driving past because you're on autopilot or you're checked out or you're flooring it and you're addicted to being busy and achieving and outrunning the sadness and whatever it is that you're trying to outrun, you are missing this extraordinary view because your nervous system is just revving. And healing is the process of slowing it down and pulling over and doing the inner work. And again, you know, how to meet yourself this latest incredible transformative work of yours, the whole first third of the book is dedicated to exercises to help you do that. And so that's the first thing that I wanted to say, that what we're talking about when we talk about nervous system regulation is imagine a life where when you go to the grocery store and somebody else walks in front of you and grabs the last can of tomato sauce that you had gone to the store to buy, you don't lose your shit. You literally are able to tolerate that and not lose your shit. Or you get an email from work and your boss is curt with you. And it doesn't trigger a spiral of thinking that has been around since childhood where you, that's it, I'm so unworthy, I'm so stupid, the, the beat down. And so... When we talk about healing and we talk about regulating your nervous system, what she's actually saying is that you can liberate yourself from the experience of day-to-day -day life where you deliver the childhood beatdown you've been doing subconsciously forever and the small, daily, irritating, disappointing crap that happens in life doesn't send you into an emotional tsunami or send you to bury yourself in alcohol that that is what's on the other side of this. Am I correct, Dr. Nicole? 100%. And it begins um, just using a personal, lived, my, my entire childhood lived experience up until my 30s and I became aware. It begins with becoming aware, becoming conscious of yourself and your current experience and in particular of your body. And what I wanted to share was I'm, I'm a self-proclaimed hippie at heart, I like to say, because all I've ever wanted is peace, rest, a moment to just be and the freedom that I imagined that came with that. Yet what I was so largely unaware of until I began to turn that spotlight of attention down to my body is I never could rest. Um, my family used to joke with me that I used to say, I'm bored, I'm bored, run a mile a minute. I was doing, doing, always on the go, which very much mimicked always going to that next hurdle, checking that next box. To simplify it, I couldn't relax. No matter how much my mind wanted that moment of relaxation, when I didn't have anything on my schedule, for instance, or and I was just sitting there, right? Here was my day, my Sunday, it's time to relax. My body, because our body is talking to our brain and communication every moment of every day, my body was so tense. My nervous system was so dysregulated. This is where no amount of, in my opinion, positive thinking, me looking around saying, well, Nicole, nothing to worry about here. Just relax. You have nothing on your schedule. There's nothing to do. Why can't you just feel at peace? And the reason was because all of the signals that my body was sending my mind was that 
peace, relax, there is something unsafe. There's a threat because there was tension in my muscles. My nerve, like you're saying that buzz really resonated with me now. Like my body was a buzz with how much I can't just sit in relaxation. And I just wanted to share this because there are so many of us I've come to realize who we can't relax because no matter how much we want that moment of peace and we're desperately seeking it, our body is sending our mind that that's the unsafest thing to do. We have to keep going. Our mind does then begin to race with the things to worry about, begins to scan our environment with the thing that is off, begins to agitate. If there was someone near me when my body was feeling agitated and if it was a partner before long, I was probably nitpicking. I was probably creating now an interpersonal conflict because my body was so agitated that it was only a matter of time before my mind was agitated and before my environment was agitated. So the conscious awareness, again, beginning in the body, beginning in these different states of nervous system dysregulation often will give the answers to why many of you listening might not be able to feel peace, to feel restful. And again, back to the hope, I assure you rest and peace is part of it. That too is wired you know, as a possibility in our neurological human existence, many of us just have to teach our body how to return to that space. And it's not until we are peacefully, safely connected, learn how to regulate our body if it is dysregulated, that we can then feel those moments of peace, that we can then in the space of that peace, be who we are, safely share authentically who we are with someone else and ultimately create those relationships that we all desperately want and need. Incredible. As I looked around, I kept almost telling myself, well, what is wrong with you, Nicole? Why aren't you, you know, feeling good about yourself? Why aren't you feeling fulfilled? Why aren't you feeling even connected to this life that you created? 